Well, hey guys, welcome back. This week we're going to do a project that I've been meaning to do for a long time. Now, if you remember back to the scrub plane, which I made a while back, you'll know that it's all held together by pins and rivets, and that reflects the method which I used to design it and then machine it. The reason for it is it allowed me to assemble it and then tear it down several times just to make sure that everything was able to fit together properly before I pinned it in place. Now the pins do a great job to hold everything together but the whole setup to actually assemble it wasn't that great. I was using 1, 2, 3 blocks to keep everything square and hammering on them, which I was doing, probably isn't the best thing to do with 1, 2, 3 blocks. It's probably a good thing that those ones weren't very expensive. The anvil surface on the back of the vise also isn't the greatest. It's about 35 years old and it certainly looks the part. And unfortunately, it did leave a few marks on the planer. You know, one day I would like to clean it up, but today isn't that day. Instead, what I'd like to do is make a toolmaker's bench block. I've also seen them called bench anvils or staking anvils, and essentially they're just hardened steel blocks with a set of holes and a V groove for holding round stock. From what I can tell, they're generally used for hammering in and out pins, hammering rivets, and they can also be used as sort of a drill and tap guide to drill and tap straight holes. And at least for me, I'll probably get some use from it on the fly press because I'll be able to replace some of the jigs and base plates that I'm currently using. Now you're probably wondering why I'm choosing to make one rather than buying one because on the whole, they're not that expensive to buy. Well, the reason is I want a hex shaped one that I can very easily hold in the vise, which is where I do most of my hammering. Now there are some hex ones that you can buy online, but these ones are far too small to be useful. As it turns out though, Starrett do make what seems to be a really well designed bench block. You know, it ticks all my needs and it even has a big area on one side dedicated for hammering. The only problem is they're not that common to find online and the ones that I can find are going to be about four to five hundred dollars once I convert it to Australian dollars and add shipping and taxes. And really for a bench block, that is a bit more than I can afford. So what I'm going to attempt to do is make it myself. I've had this piece of 4140 offcut laying in the workshop for the past year and I think I can finally put it to use. 4140 being high tensile chromoly steel. Though 4140 probably wouldn't be my first choice of steel for this project, but unfortunately getting large diameter blanks of tool steel in this size is not exactly easy. I mean I'm sure 4140 should work, but there are better steels for the job. With that said though, if I heat treat it properly, I should be able to get this to the mid to high 50s Rockville C hardness. For reference, the current anvil is only about 40 to 45 Rockville C hardness, so once I temper it back, it should be plenty tough enough for the job. First things first though, let's get it in the lathe and get it cleaned up. I genuinely have no idea how they managed to get this piece so lopsided, but I guess that's why it was in the scrap heap. But because it's so lopsided, I'm going to take it easy for the first few cuts. So for the first few passes, I'm going to be using these sharp carbide inserts. They're not really made for these types of cuts or this material, and they're not going to last long, but they will keep the cutting forces as low as possible, and they should be unlikely to get snagged as they enter the cut. With the mostly now cleaned up, I'll swap it out to my normal inserts and get it finished. It's also worth pointing out that this is producing a good amount of heat, so I'll set up my spray coolant to try and keep the part as cool as possible.
And it's at times like this that I'm really happy that I have a lathe with a proper gearbox. It's taking a lot of power to do these cuts, especially in 4140, and getting the torque from the gearbox is really helping the lathe push through it. Finally, I can slow the feed down and do a finishing pass. And finally, I can do the outside. With the first side now done, I can now get it flipped to clean up the other side. Now for this part, concentricity is not hugely important, so I can use the three jaw and that's going to be good enough. I now mark out the centre and that's going to be the lathe work done for the moment. It's also worth pointing out that I've seen that on a lot of bench blocks, the underside is bored out, but I wasn't able to find the exact reason for this, but at least to me, it hasn't caused any issues. Over at the milling machine, I'll get the vise swapped out for the dividing head and I'll get the part loaded up. I'll be cutting in the hex pattern now, so when it comes to the next steps, I can simply hold it in the mill vise, which makes everything a lot easier. Now to get this done, I'll be using a carbide end mill and coolant, and I am going to have to take multiple passes to get it done. 4140, by all means, is a fantastic material to machine, but you do need a rigid and powerful milling machine to do it. Mine certainly isn't, so I will be taking it easy. The coolant should help my carbide end mill last as long as possible, but this material is taking a lot of life out of it. And that is the hex now machined. All in all, I think it looks really good. Now I'll simply use the center which I drew before in order to find the center of the part and then I'll set that on the DRO. Being perfectly on centre is not hugely important here, so doing it this way is good enough. Now when it comes to drilling the holes, I don't think there is an exact prescribed set and diameter of holes that you must cut, but I'm going to do the most common ones that I use. Those being 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, all the way up to 18mm in diameter. And they're all going to be slightly made oversized. As for the hole spacings, that was all worked out on the computer, just to make sure that everything was roughly equally spaced and it didn't look weird. Now if this was mild steel, I could probably do all these holes with drills without too much worry. But since this is 4140 and it does take a bit more horsepower than I really have available, I was pretty much able to do everything up to 12mm before my milling machine ran out of power.
So at that point, I did everything else up to 12mm and then came in with the boring head to take the last few holes up to their final size. And fair play to it, it leaves a fantastic finish in the holes. Now the next thing I need to do is cut the V channel. Unfortunately I don't have the proper V cutting bit for this job. So what I decided to do was see if this carbide router bit would work. Sometimes they do work in steel and sometimes they don't. Now this one did work for about one pass before pretty much giving up. No real surprise there but you know it was worth a shot. Now I did think about holding the part at a 45 degree angle and then coming in with an end mill, but unfortunately the part was a little bit too big to do that. So instead what I did was I tried out this high speed steel countersink bit. And thankfully even though it isn't designed for this type of work, it did seem to work. Unfortunately the cut is a little bit smaller than I would have liked, so what I'll do is I'll cut a little bit to each side to widen it, and then I'll machine out the centre with a slot. I'm also going to make a secondary smaller slot for when I'm working with smaller pieces of rod. With the part now deburred, that is all the mill work now done. All in all, I think the part has come out looking really nice. What we need to do now is harden it. Now the raw stock I was using was annealed, so it wasn't very hard. If I started to hammer it, I would leave quite a few dents. However, whilst 4140 can be hardened, I do need to be careful about how I go about hardening it. 4140 is an alloy steel and it's going to be a lot more sensitive to heat treatment than the carbon steel that I normally use. As a lot of you have probably noticed, when I'm heat treating carbon steel, I never worry a whole lot about whether I'm using oil or salt water as a quenching medium. You know, unless I'm worried about the part warping, I'm generally going to use water because water is a lot easier to set up than oil. And once I've quenched it, I'm able to play around with the tempering temperatures to get roughly the hardness that I need. For home workshop heat treatment, that is perfectly adequate. 4140 though is a bit different. Even though it is more of a hardenable material, there is less room for error when heat treating it. From what I've read and the few times that I have heat treated parts that are made from 4140, if you don't follow the proper steps, there is a much bigger risk that you can crack the part. Now 4140 primarily seems to be an oil quenching steel, especially if you want to get those high hardnesses. And thankfully oil carries a much reduced risk of cracking compared to quenching it in water. I'm pretty sure if I quenched a big piece of 4140 like this in water, we get a pretty big crack running down the center of it. For this part I'm simply going to use 6 litres of vegetable oil and that's going to be good enough for this part. It also occurred to me later that this probably isn't the best shape for heat treating. You know the mass is very unevenly spread out so it will probably need grinding afterwards because it's probably going to warp ever so slightly.
So once the furnace is up to temperature, I'll get the part all fluxed up and then I'll pop it in the furnace for about 30 minutes. So off camera, I tried my best to get it cleaned up as good as I could, and I also tempered it in the oven at about 220 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, the flux didn't do the greatest job at protecting the part, so even if I wasn't planning on doing so, I am going to have to get this part surface ground. Unfortunately, since I don't have a proper surface grinder, or you know, proper grinding setup, I'm going to go with my backup method, which is simply to clamp a spindle with a motor in the tool post and attach a grinding stone. This method, whilst it does look quite a bit dodgy, has worked well in the past. I've just never used it on anything this large before. Now getting a good surface finish here was a bit of trial and error and I wasn't able to completely pin it down. Too fast and I'd leave these very deep swirl marks and too slow and I'd leave burn marks. And it was mostly up to feeling through the handwheel to see how fast I needed to travel. And that is the final result. Not perfect by any means, but a big improvement over the previous finish. I think using some different stones would leave a much better finish, but I'll have to try that out in the future. As for the grinding itself, this method worked a lot better than I thought it would. It's all good to within about 10 or 15 microns, except for one little area in one corner. Not exactly sure why this corner is a little bit different, but on the whole, I'm really happy with this result. Now hardness wise, we're in the region of about 50 to 55 Rockwell C hardness. The 50 file doesn't bite in, but the 55 does. Now I'm not exactly sure if 55 is too hard, but if it is, I can always temper it back to the mid 40s. Anyway, let's go ahead and test it out. So what I'll do is I'll get it in the vise and get my ratchet screwdriver, which I made a few years ago. The ratchet assembly is held together by a pin, which can be very easily aligned with the hole and then hammered out. Alright, and that's about it. I'm sure you're going to be seeing this a lot in the future, so I guess keep an eye out for it. And apart from that, I hope you enjoyed this video, hope you learned something new, thanks for watching, I'll see you next week.